talking about post-award management. So today we'll look at um, what happens after your proposal is submitted and then notification that you have won, which would be amazing. And then how to get started and sort of what some of the best practices are and then next steps as far as um, ongoing reporting requirements for your award. And I'm primarily gonna talk about, um, I'll give NSF for some comparison, but I'm primarily talking about NIH today. So uh, if you have uh, questions about other agencies, you can drop those in the chat and, and potentially between um, myself and Shelly and, and maybe some other folks on the call, we can answer those questions. So you submit your proposal, now what happens? Well, with NIH, what happens is your proposal goes to the Center for Scientific Review and they assign your proposal to an institute or center. There is a form that allows you to request what institute and center you want, but if you don't request one, then they assign one for you. They also assign your proposal to a study section, which is separate than the institute and center. Um, and then your proposal goes through the peer review process. And once it completes the peer review process, NIH releases your score, or maybe you find out you didn't get scored, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, and then your summary statements are posted. And that whole process typically takes about four months, um, sometimes a little longer, sometimes a little shorter, um, but, but um, you are able to follow that process throughout the entire time um, through your, your ERA Commons. So you can go into your ERA Commons account, which is what you have to have an ERA Commons in order to submit a proposal to NIH. You can go into Commons and you can track your proposal where it is in the process. They'll tell you at any time. Every proposal is assigned a unique number. And I just break that down for you here in the bottom half of that slide to show you which what each part of your uh, proposal number means. So the first three are um, a letter R is the mechanism um, that NIH uses and 44 refers to an SBIR. So that might say R41, which would mean it was a phase one STTR or it might say R42, which would mean it was a phase two STTR. So that R40 number, it's gonna be between 41 and 44 for SBIR and STTR. And then the next two are, are, would be a two letter abbreviation and that represents the institute or center. Um, and so in this case, the institute or center for example sake is uh, NIAD, Allergy and Infectious Disease, and their two letter abbreviation is AI. And then immediately following in yellow are your actual proposal numbers. And anytime you have communication with a program officer or anybody at NIH about your proposal at any time during the process, you're going to want to reference that number. So once your uh, proposal has been through the peer review process, a couple of things might happen. Um, we're gonna start on the left side of this slide and work our way to the right. So the first thing that happens is that your proposal is not scored. And that happens for about 50% of all proposals. Now, even if you're not scored, you still, review summary, you still receive summary statements from three reviewers, sometimes four, but usually three reviewers. Um, and they provide you feedback, detailed feedback on your proposal on ways to improve it. They give you strengths and weaknesses of each of the scoring criteria for every section. If you are not scored, there is no way your proposal will be funded. So you can, you can rest assured at that point that the proposal will not be funded. In the center, you'll see uh, the gray area, which means you get a score, but it's a score that we're not sure whether or not you're going to be funded. And that's how the majority of the scores are. Um, most, most scores that are in the gray area are going to be scoring for NIH goes, it's like golf. I think it's golf. I think that's the sport where not a good athlete, but the lower number is better. So um, if you get a 20 at NIH, that's an exceptional score. So those gray area scores we'll see can hover in between the, the uh, low 30s um, up to the high 20s. So it just sort of depends. Um, sometimes you can get a score and we know with that score that you're not funded. So if you receive a score in the 50s, you will not be funded. So you got scored, 
but you didn't achieve a score that's fundable. Um, I would say that most of the time scores in the 40s are also not fundable. Um, I have seen some proposals that score as low as a 38 or a 36 get funded, but those are pretty unusual circumstances. And then the best case scenario is you're scored and it's a fundable score. Now people ask a lot, if, you, if you're familiar with NIH, you may be familiar with the pay line process that they use, um, which means each institute or center has a certain score that generally speaking, if you achieve it, you will be funded. And those pay lines are moving targets, first of all, um, so they're not super dependable. And second of all, um, there's some authority within SBIR and SDTR to sort of swerve outside of those pay lines. So they're not always a super dependable way for us to predict whether or not you're going to be scored. But generally speaking, if you receive a score of a 23 on a phase one application, you will be funded. Um, not the case on a phase two, um, that's, that's a scoring criteria is much harder, but uh, a high score like that on a phase one, you'll definitely be funded. Um, and you could receive, uh, like I said, a score of 32 and get funded, 34 and get funded, 28, anywhere in that range, just depending on the agency, I'm sorry, the institute or center, and depending on where they are in their funding cycle. Now, if you have a fundable score, the next step is uh, what's called JIT or just-in-time information. Now, unlike NIH, here's what happens when you submit a proposal to NSF. You submit and then you wait. And that's all you know. So unlike NIH where you can go in at any time and see where your proposal is in the process, all NSF tells you is one of three things pending, declined, or awarded. So most of the time that you're going to go in, so uh, NIA, NSF, the last round we submitted in April, uh, I'm sorry, March, um, they still haven't made announcements on most of them. So, and, and there's no further information available, just pending. Um, and then one day you'll get an email. And that email will either request additional information or provide notice that your proposal was not funded. And for NSF, the feedback from your reviewers is available immediately on your, in your NSF um, user profile in research.gov. Now, NSF's request, I can't remember if I have a slide about this. Yeah, okay. Um, so if you're close to getting funded, remember NIH will issue that just in time or that JIT request. Um, these are time sensitive. So you'll get an email from uh, the, usually the grants manager at the institute or center that may be funding your application. And they'll request for specific, they'll request specific information. And you submit that information through grants.gov. Sometimes they may ask you to also, also attach it to an email and send it to them, but primarily you submit all of that information so that it becomes part of your grant record through grants through ERA Commons. Um, let's see. Oh, and also they may say things to you, they may request things from you like IRB approval or uh, information from IACUC, which is for if you're doing uh, experiments with vertebrate animals. You may not have those things, uh, when the, the information is requested. And that's okay, you need to tell NIH that. Those things can take some time. And um, what they do is they issue a notice of award, but they have restrictions on, for example, human subjects if you're still waiting for your IRB approval. IRB approval is not required at time of submission. It's not even necessarily re required at time of award, but it is required before you do any work with human subjects. And there'll be restrictions on your notice of award if you don't have it at time of award. Now, NSF will also send an email, but it will be an email requesting an insane amount of information. Um, on the last one that I just worked on, I printed out the email request and it was 14 pages long. Now, a lot of the information that's in that request is not actually pertinent to your application. So sometimes you just say not applicable, or they may ask you, the question may be, can you confirm that all employees are um, permitted to work in the United States? And all you have to do is answer, yes, all employees are permitted to work in the United States. 
but it is an insane amount of information. And the turnaround time is usually five business days. So huge uh, hurdle to overcome to get funding from NSF, uh, no doubt. Uh, for example, they'll ask you, always ask you to uh, revise your budget justification. I've never seen an NSF award where they didn't ask you to revise the budget justification. And you have to link to um, job descriptions within the Bureau of Labor Statist and Statistics uh, to, to substantiate the salaries requested. So an insane amount of information from NSF. Um, so other things to expect in those requests. Uh, for both NIH and NSF, um, they will request uh, documents related to other support. Now, NSF will ask you, has anything changed since you submitted? And if, the, if it hasn't, you can just say, nothing has changed, everything's the same. But we don't submit other support with NIH proposals. And so if you have JIT, one of the first things they're going to want is other support, which is simply a listing of um, the other obligations that everybody on your project already has. Uh, there's uh, something called an SPIR STTR funding agreement. Um, that's standard across all agencies in the program. So you can Google that and get that document and review it in advance. Uh, it's pretty clear cut and standard. Um, typically, they ask for a copy of the company's W-9. They both typically ask for proof of active SAM status, which I simply log into SAM, take a screenshot of the active status, and then put that in a Word document. Um, sometimes they will ask for, uh, if a fair amount of time have, has passed from the time you submitted the proposal to award, they may ask for letters confirming um, people are still engaged and involved in the project. There is the financial systems questionnaire, um, which you answer about the status of your financial systems. We'll talk a little bit about financial systems in a little bit. Um, all kinds of, uh, depending on the institute or center, for example, if you receive an award from NCI, cancer, uh, they have an incredibly high threshold uh, for business operations prior to award. Um, and you will be asked to provide all kinds of proof of policies um, in place in the company, as well as um, a p &L and a balance sheet, a chart of accounts, all kinds of information. Not necessarily the case when you get an award from National Eye Institute. So it just sort of depends on who you're getting an award from. Uh, one really important thing is signed lease agreements. Um, they'll frequently ask for that no matter who the agency is or what institute or center. Um, and that's a document that demonstrates the fact that the company has permission to conduct the work that you described in the location that you described. So if you're in a shared office space like a, a accelerator or a, um, a, you know, a, a work, um, I'm totally blanking on what it's called, you know, a shared workspace, um, you, you need to at least get a letter from them saying that, you know, you, that's where you, you work. Oh, also check and make sure if you have state matching funds available, that's a good time to do that as well. Hey, Chris, okay, so now, Chris, yes. Um, yeah. Somebody was wondering if you could briefly comment on how that works for DOE proposals. Oh, shoot. On the review process? I think so. The question was general. I don't, I don't have a lot of experience in DOE. Do you, Shelly? No, unfortunately, that's not one I do a lot either. Yeah. DOE is a really interesting agency. I think there are a handful of people that work in DOE a lot. Um, and then the rest of us don't really work in it. I'm sorry. I wish I had more information on that um, for sure, but um, I don't. We can try to get you some more information. I do have some contacts. So We'll, we'll try to answer that person later. Thank you, Shelly. All right, so you won. Well, the most important thing, if you take away nothing else from this workshop today, this is the most important thing that you need to know. You have not received the award until you have a notice of award in your hands. It doesn't matter what anybody tells you in an email. It doesn't matter how much information you send to the agency. It doesn't matter what your score is. Nothing matters until you have the notice of award in your hands. I have seen awards that are so close and then they just 
disappear. So until you have that notice of award in your, in your hand, assume that you're still in the pending stage. So the first thing that you do when you receive your notice of award is typically you inform your partners. That might be a research institution, like a university that you're working with. It might be contractors or collaborators, consultants, advisors, uh, whoever you're working with, um, just to let them know, hey, we got the award. Here's the projected start date. Um, you know, are you still good to participate in this project? You should also at that time make any updates to the scope of work for each one of those uh, involved parties. A lot of times because of the time span in between submission to when you get the notice of award, which even in NIH, you could be talking about nine months um, from start, very start to very end. Um, you know, you may need to update the scope of work based on things that you've accomplished um, as a company in between the time of submission until award. And then you need to negotiate those contracts. Now, if you're talking about working with a research institution like a university, allow plenty of time for this. Um, this is usually a pretty time consuming process and it will vary sort of the depth of that agreement will vary on what kind of work the research institution is doing. So typically in phase one, we're not talking about a significant contribution to intellectual property. In phase two, there may be a pretty significant a significant contribution to intellectual property, and that's going to have to be negotiated a, a, a little bit um, in more detail for the agreement. Um, one example is in phase one, uh, it's not uncommon for the company to develop a product and then carry it over to a university, a university test it with 15 people and provides a report back to the company. No intellectual property exchange there. So the agreement is typically pretty standard, but it does take time. And it'll also vary depending on the institution, whether they want you to bring a draft to them or whether they have a standard draft to bring to you. Either way is fine. NIH does have a standard agreement available on their website. It's kind of overkill for a phase one um, without the involvement of intellectual property, but it's a good place to start. If they send you a document, uh, I would highly recommend investing in an attorney to review that for you. Again, because intellectual property is such a sensitive issue, um, you know, you want to protect yourself going into an agreement with the university. And just like everybody else in an agreement, the university will always be looking out for their best interest. Uh, it's really important to understand the invoicing cycles that universities are going to uh, implement. Sometimes that's quarterly, sometimes it's monthly. And the reason that's important, because when you look at your funding, uh, it's super easy, just depending on how good you are with money in general in life. Um, you know, if you look at the account and you're like, oh, my gosh, we still have one hundred twenty six thousand dollars in there. But you forgot that the university hasn't invoiced you for any of the money yet. Um, and then at the end of the project, they send you an invoice for one hundred twenty six thousand dollars. You could be in trouble. So just understand that and plan appropriately. And then again, you need to establish those IP agreements up front. Um, if your research involves human subjects, uh, the company must file for an FWA number. Um, this is done online, super easy, um, but you cannot use the research institutions. The company must have their own FWA number. And then um, if you are doing research with human subjects, of course, you have to have IRB approval documentation. And if you're working with a research institution and you're using their uh, IRB, that's totally fine. But once it's approved, request a copy of the approval for your records. Uh, anybody on your staff who's involved with human subjects research needs to have uh, certification and uh, demonstrate Prove, provide a certification for um, that you've been through training on research with human subjects. Super easy. Um, I think there may even be a free class. I'm not 100% sure. I haven't done it for a few years, but um, there may be a free class. NIH used to have a free class and then they switched to, um, to this platform or you, sometimes the university will allow you to tap into theirs and take it. Um, but even if the, the company is not conducting the human research themselves, if you're the principal investigator and you're going to have interactions with the human subjects or the human subject site, you need to have that certification. Super easy, like 10 hours or something, or not even 10 hours, maybe five hours online. Um, let's see. 
NIH, as I mentioned earlier, may issue the notice of award with restrictions until your IRB has been approved. So um, I have a phase, two, I'm working on a phase two that was funded in 2018. Maybe it was funded in 19. Um, the project is really behind and um, it's a multi-site clinical trial and we just received IRB approval uh, in May. So, and that's because we didn't need it yet, but just to show you, like they issued our notice of award a long time ago, but once we received IRB approval, they reissued the notice of award, releasing that, that hold on human subjects. If your research involves uh, animals, you need an assurances number from OLA. Uh, again, if you're doing at the research institution, um, in this instance, you can use the research institution's OLA number, um, but they will provide the notice of award and have restrictions on it um, if, if you don't have that completed yet. Okay, for business operations, here are some things that you can expect. And it will depend, as I mentioned earlier, on institute or center um, and even agency, but even within NIH, definitely huge um, variation among institutes and centers. Uh, you may be expected to have written policies on file. Um, those include a conflict of interest policy. Um, NCI has a list and includes a credit card policy, a travel policy. Um, these are you know, kind of standard policies for your company. The good news is with the internet, it's pretty easy to sort of Google these and come up with a standard template for these policies. I know it seems silly if you're talking about a company of one um, or maybe even two, but these are just the idea here is that you sort of instill good business practices from the very beginning. You need to implement a qualified bookkeeping system um, and uh, different agencies sort of have different definitions of what qualified means. Generally speaking, it allows you to keep a chart of accounts. Um, QuickBooks does qualify. I I'm the worst at anything bookkeeping, um, so I'm a bad one to ask, but I've heard from some accountants um, that specialize in federal grants that QuickBooks isn't the best solution, but it is one that you can make work. Uh, again, you have to establish that chart of accounts. NIH has a sample available on their website. If you don't have your own chart of accounts, QuickBooks also has a um, chart of accounts that you can use. You need to establish a timekeeping system. Now, this is where there's a great deal of variation from institute or center. So again, um, cancer has a very high threshold and um, they implement the timekeeping requirement right from the beginning, even on a phase one. Most other agencies um, only become concerned with timekeeping uh, really in phase two when you open yourself to an audit. Anybody that receives more than $750,000 a year in direct costs from the federal government is subject to an audit. So if you are audited, you will be required to pr produce timesheets. Um, technically speaking, it would be best practices to start keeping them in phase one, uh, but it's not usually implemented until phase two. I'll talk a little bit more in detail about timesheets in a later slide. Uh, for NIH, um, you access your funds through a platform called PMS, the Payment Management System. Um, if you already have an account on, P on the PMS, you can just kind of tie your, your new grant award to that account, um, but otherwise you have to establish an account in PMS. I think I have a slide on that later too. It's kind of a tricky process, but. And then I typically do a quick um, side of, sort of grant track, tracking spending spreadsheet um, that breaks down the, um, origin the budget that was funded which again is usually gonna be slightly different than the budget you submitted. Um, there's almost always budget negotiations involved in the award process. So I, I just create a little uh, spreadsheet and then <clears throat> use that to sort of track spending as we go. All right, timekeeping. Um, all employees are expected to keep track of their time. That's not just employees working on the project, it is all employees. Uh, in addition, time is expected to be tracked for all projects, not just the NIH project. Um, and your time should be tracked for PO and personal or, or holidays and, um, you know, if the office is closed for a flood or whatever, um, you know, that all needs to be noted on your timesheet. Electronic timesheet keeping is allowed. 
um, but it still needs to meet the requirements of the other systems, which is a two signature system. So if you have timesheets that are kept electronically, somebody else needs to verify them um, for payroll. And I believe that the electronic timekeeping systems used by um, Intuit do that. Um, but there's other electronic timekeeping systems too. Uh, best practices would be uh, um, really what they say is a quarter of an hour. Um, the guidelines say a minimum increment of, of one hour increments, um, but, but really best practices would be quarter hour increments. NIH does not provide a sample of a timesheet intentionally, um, but some things that need to be on there include project coding. And so um, the project coding should not be NIH project, all other stuff. So it should be really, you know, NIH project, um, you know, experiments in the lab, you know, general business operations or whatever. It should be um, broken down by what those activities are. Uh, and then again, you have to have a place for all the hours, all the different kinds of hours an employee can have. It should have the employee name on it and it should require two signatures. Okay, setting up the payment management system. Um, this is, can really be challenging. Um, not at all user-friendly. Um, although it's really interesting. Um, I have a client who does their own work in the payment management system and she has one interface. And when I log into the payment management system, I have the old school interface. And so I don't know why I'm not seeing this updated version that she sees, um, but mine is sort of reminiscent of DOS. Um, it's, it's pretty rudimentary. Um, and in order to get the account established, obviously we're talking about really sensitive stuff here. Uh, so you have to go to the, P the PMS website and print this form, the SF1199A, um, and you have to take it to your bank and get it signed. So um, it, it, it must be a company bank account, not your personal bank account. And then there's a couple of days to sort of set that up. So this is not a quick process either. And then once, that you, once you have access to the PMS, I typically do a test payment of like $3 or $4 or whatever, just to make sure that everything is working okay because there's nothing worse than you know, needing access to $65,000 and not being able to get it. Um, so just do a quick test payment. Funds typically show up in your account within 48 hours. Most often it's 24, but just on the safe side, allow yourself 48. Um, and then uh, you know, typically we're operating here on a reimbursement basis. Um, so you incur the expense, you go in and draw down. If you are going to operate on an advancement basis, the funds need to come into your bank account and leave your bank account within 72 hours. And so what that means, remember I talked earlier about understanding the university's uh, invoicing cycle. If you know they're gonna send you an invoice on the 15th, then you, know, you might draw down the funds on the 12th or the, the 14th and they hit your account on the 15th, and then you can release the check on the 15th. The, the money cannot stay in your account. You cannot collect interest on government funding. Hey, Chris, going back to timekeeping real quick. Um, somebody yep. had a question about timekeeping for subcontractors. Uh, well, so that is um, sort of out of your hands. Um, you, are not required to audit the subcontractors. No. Is that the question? I yeah, think okay. that was probably the question. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, they should have their own best practices. And if it's a university, um, you know, generally speaking, they they are. And then most other folks, we typically just do on a, a contractual basis anyway. Like, hey, here's the flat fee, but you're not responsible for that. Um. Well, I guess I shouldn't say that. I, I, I should say you are operating under the assumption that everybody follows those good business practices. You, will not, you would not be able to go into a university and audit their time cards. Uh, they wouldn't let you do that. Um, if I think if you were concerned about an individual who was working on the project, um, you know, it would be fine to request timesheets, but it's not, you don't have to provide those to NIH. 
Um, so for records, I would maintain copies of all contracts, subawards, agreements, purchase orders. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier, if um, you have any kind of um, updates to the scope of work or letters, keep contract, keep copies of all of that. Um, we just had a, a notice of award came out the other day and the university from the time of submission until now increased their overhead rate. Um, and so, you know, requested a, a copy, a new copy of their overhead rate agreement. And we're going to keep that on our files so that if NIH audits us and wants to see what the university overhead was charging, we can show that paperwork. So just sort of think about all the things that if you were to be audited, you would need to support your case and your business practices. And those are the kind of things you want to keep, keep in, on file. Uh, again, I do a kind of quick look of the PMS drawdowns on the grant. Um, and here's a big thing is I make notes on each drawdown. I mean, you think like, oh, I'll know where those numbers come from. Um, but then when you go back and you try to figure out, you know, why did I draw down, like here's an invoice for $14,000. Why did I draw down 27,892? You know, and you're sort of like, can't figure it out. So I keep very detailed notes as to what each penny that I draw down, which line item or the reason for the drawdown um, along with the date uh, so that you can kind of reconcile and, and be sure that you understand, you understand and remember what each penny was going for. Also, it's helpful while you're working on the project to keep track of any um, patents or publications. You'll be required to report these to NIH at the end of the project and in your phase two application. And so um, it's best to just keep track of those as, as you go. Uh, for reporting, um, I create a template for tracking the progress of the project. And the template that I use is um, literally just take the specific aims out of the funded um, research strategy and put aim one, aim two, aim three. And then I just, as the principal investigator works through each aim, I just ask them to keep like a lab notebook of everything they do. And that is where we keep every detail of the project. It includes pictures, it includes test results. The, the final report of a phase one, you know, might be 30 pages, 25 pages. That is not what you're going to turn into NIH. Those are your internal records of how you completed the project. Um, it's so much easier to take that and scale it down to what NIH needs instead of trying to remember and go back a year and a half later and recreate every step you did in the lab. So just kind of do that as you go. Um, for the PMS, the payment management system, you are required to file quarterly reports. In addition, you're required to file an annual report and then you're required to fi file a final financial report. This was done in Commons and now they're moving it to PMS. So all financial information will be done in PMS now. Um, this can get a little bit tricky because of the requirement for the annual. If your grant ends in April, you file your final in April and then you're like, oh, I'm done. And then you know, come around the end of the year, they want you to file an annual. Well, it's because within that calendar, you're still within that calendar year and you have to file that, that annual. So um, once the grant is closed out, then you can assume that, that the PMS, you're done, you're done filing reports. I would keep your PMS account active uh, if you think you're going to apply for more grants, even once the project is closed. Um, and you just need to do that by kind of logging in every once in a while, they'll send you they'll send you emails saying your account is about to expire, log in. It's just as hard to get it reopened as it was to initially um, get it activated. So it's worth it to just kind of keep it open. And then for NIH, you're only required to submit an annual project report. So uh, if your phase one is six months, you just submit uh, an annual report on that project. It's filed in ERA Commons, Again, it's much shorter than the report that you will hopefully prepare as you're working through the project. A lot of it is drop down menus on a, a web form or boxes that are limited to like 500 words of text. Uh, lots of questions about who did what. Um, you have to report at that point inventions and patents. 
Um, and then your, your phase one final report is also summarized in your phase two application. So again, having that report that sort of documented everything as you're going along makes it a lot easier to prepare those documents when they come due. Plus you also, everybody has to file an annual report with the Office of Research Integrity. Um, there is an exemption for small businesses and they have the template on their website, but you still have to file it. You'll get notices about it. Um, it would be very hard to ignore, um, but it is an annual report that you need to file. And then once the grant is done, you enter the closeout phase. Um, and that is a final, that is a, a, an official phase that the grant is in. Um, so you file the final report via ERA Commons, you file that final PMS, um, and then eventually uh, NIH will send you a closeout letter and keep that for your files. Um, that way, if there's, we just, I just had a USDA grant that was like four years old. Somebody sent them an email saying, you never filed this report. And we emailed them and they're like, oh, sorry, the system was nuts. You know, they had some kind of internal technology blurb, which was great, but we knew because we had records that the report was filed and they had a closeout letter. So just keep that on hand um, in your records. All right, any questions? Tried to leave more time for questions this time. Hang on, here there is a question just coming in. Let me scroll back. Um, at the NSF, the sequence of decisions for the SDT award goes like um, NSF program director's recommendation, then division director uh, action recommendation officer. Oh, is this just information? Um, then officer of the division of grants and agreements issuing an official notification award after administration review. For uh, they're looking for comment on the scenario, but they have um, for our startup step one above is incomplete. However, steps two and three have been postponed till after a certain date um, when the new fiscal year starts at NSF. And they're asking if you could comment on the scenario. Well. <laughs> Not, not on that specific scenario, because I don't know all the details, but I can tell you that um, people make all the funding decisions, obviously, ultimately. And so it is not uncommon to have a cog in the wheel who is sitting on your paperwork. Um, and you know, sometimes that's a delicate balance between um, bothering that, I, I don't wanna say bothering, but checking in with that person you know, and um, sort of, trying to bite your tongue and, and wait a little bit. Um, most of the time I try to remember, you know, that these people are incredibly busy and NSF, I do not know what in the world has been going on at NSF. The only thing I can think of is that they must have just been overwhelmed. They had a special call for COVID. And I think it was like, they, I mean, they just, and they, then they withdrew it. I mean, I think it just must have been total inundation. And I think they're still digging out of it. I mean, proposals submitted in March or April, and we still know nothing. Nothing. It's very behind what they normally are. Yeah. It's incredible. So I think they're, they're not in the best place. Um, I've seen that with NIH as well, where it will be a grant administrator um, who's sitting on paperwork. And so sometimes in that instance, it sort of depends on who's sending you these emails. Um, an email to the grant administrator copying the program officer, just saying like, hey, I wanna check in on where we are on this process. And then you might be surprised and very quickly get, you know, oh yes, we're getting ready to issue the notice of award or um, it, it, people can hold up your awards for sure. And I think it's just uh, a really precarious position to be in where you're sort of tip, tiptoeing around um, and I think there are some notorious paper hoarders at NSF. Um, who <laughs> a couple years ago, they cleaned out many of the old people. I, I'll tell you a funny story. I, I, we had a client who was trying to get a notice of award and this particular program officer who had been around forever, they were exchanging emails back and forth and they were very frustrated. And I responded to their email that he's just dead wood. And he was ac accidentally on that email. 
<laughs> and, and responded and said, you know, well, I'm sorry you think I'm dead wood, you know, or whatever. He fortunately subs subsequently retired, but he literally was holding up the entire process. Um, so it happens. Um, there was a question and I'll answer this about an update on the uh, Illinois SBR matching funds. Unfortunately, no, we don't have any updates. So as you know, I, we announced that it was passed. However, where it's at is in appropriations. And so while the bill was passed, they still have to appropriate the money and that's where it's mm. being held up at currently. So we don't yet have any of the guidelines released to us as far as eligibility or um, what the exact amount of the award is. It's presumably um, 50,000 is what the matching funds were dedicated, supposed to be um, as far as the bill. But again, we're waiting for appropriations to get the exact details. Okay. So that's the status of that. Um, and then there was another question asking about um, when you negotiate, when a company negotiates their indirect cost rate? Oh, that's a good question. Um, negotiating your indirect cost rate would not be advisable for a startup um, who's going to be doing a number of SBIR awards because the majority of the time, the 40% that you can claim on your own is going to be better than, now NSF grants you that you're allowed to ask for 40%, they grant you that under the assumption that you have calculated your indirect rate and it is at least or greater than 40%. But the majority of the time, if you sat down and calculated that, um, it wouldn't quite be uh, that high at the very beginning. And um, they won't pay much more than that. So um, they will for universities all day long. I mean, you know, 60%, 62%, whatever. Um, but it, it's not very advantageous for uh, small businesses to negotiate an overhead rate at, at the early stage. Now, if you're going to like, you know, become an SBIR machine, um, maybe look at it. But I, I don't think it's very advantageous. I've, I've been in the business 20 years. I have never had a client that has a negotiated rate. How about you, Shelly? Yeah, I don't think it's very advantageous in the beginning. Um, often you're going to have to after you've had, especially once you've had uh, phase twos or a couple, especially a second phase two, I've seen where they will literally want you to negotiate when you're going through the auditing process and then you will have to go through that. But in the beginning, no, I would always go with the safe rate. Yeah. Um, and then there was a question, uh, says 40% standard, which is the safe rate for NIH, but different agencies do have different rates. So NIH is 40%. NSF has two separate ways you can calculate your overhead. It's either 10% of the total project cost or 50% of the total um, salaries and wages. So they typically come out to be surprisingly close to each other. And, um, you know, we just go with whichever one fits in the budget best. Because NSF is that hard cap, so you can't go over like you can on NIH. Right. Oh, and NSF will always, always, all, I've never seen an email from NSF that doesn't say in that pre-award when they're negotiating your award, that doesn't say, oh, your overhead rate seems a little high. I really want to see more money go to R&D. Like, like, do not fall for it. Do not be guilted into that. You need the overhead. Just ignore. You're sticking with your overhead. Yep. Wow, there are actually two different people in here, one who has filed in December of 2020 and one in September of 2020 that are still pending with the NSF. That is insane. Now that's really long. That is insane. And the same thing, I'm sure, like no information. It just says pending. It should not be that long. It shouldn't be. And you know, they went to this rolling deadline process with the sort of promise that they were going to reduce the award time down to, I think they said at one point, three to four months or something like that. Um, and now we've gone the opposite direction. So they, I don't know what's going on. I really don't. Yeah, I don't know either. They still seem to be keeping up on the pitches relatively quickly, yeah. but yeah, but not the full proposals. So bizarre. Very, very hard to tell, but I, I can't help but think that COVID has got to be part of it because I think that was just, they must have just been inundated. I mean, they're probably still digging out of that. 
I think I myself worked on five NSF COVID proposals, you know, like everybody was like, okay. Yeah. If there are no other questions, um, then we'll wrap this up. We will have the recording available soon that I will um, send out of this uh, webinar to everybody who is registered. Um, and like I said, um, I will put information about upcoming um, SBR 101s. We do them every fourth Wednesday. And um, I put into, into the chat, if you are interested in one-on-one -on -one help with your uh, proposal, please um, go to the Illinois Fast Center website or to um, the link that I gave you and fill out the form and we will be happy to help you with your proposals.